morning, everybody. Uh, Danny uh, has convinced me that a computer should have written my paper for sure, <laughs> uh, filled with uh, biases and noise, uh, no doubt. But basically, I'm uh, the opening act of a series of papers today on the macroeconomic implications of uh, the digital age and artificial intelligence uh, specifically. And my uh, basic point uh, that I would like to argue is that it's uh, macroeconomically important. It's uh, very evident in the data for decades. Uh, and a lot more is to come. And the questions of uh, what happens when machines replace workers is a very real uh, and important uh, question, not uh, a fantasy. And it's not something for the future. It's something that's been underway for a long time. I think it's probably right to say, in, in some sense, that the modern uh, high-income world economies, and especially the US economy, have been playing out the introduction of a general purpose technology of uh, digital information for the last 60 years. And so we're watching a revolution that continues to unfold. And the revolution has not lost any steam. Uh, it's, um, that's a mixed metaphor, I guess, in GPTs. Uh, it has not lost any bits or, or uh, any uh, uh, depth. Uh, it's probably accelerating because of the ability of machines to substitute for very sophisticated work. And so I do believe in a kind of uh, not quite singularity necessarily, but a, an acceleration. And I think that it shows uh, in, in the labor market. So I have three basic propositions. One is that machines can and do substitute for labor. Automation is a real phenomenon. It, is obscured in the way we learn economics because uh, the Cobb-Douglas production function in a solo growth model doesn't allow for it. So it takes some decades to overcome, uh, for me at least, what I learned. But uh, there are ways that are sensible to model automation, and it is a pervasive phenomenon. That's, that's number one. Second, and very importantly, uh, smart machines embody skilled labor in the form of R&D and direct expertise. So there is that complementarity uh, of uh, skills and uh, technology that we observe and have talked about for decades. But it's not a kind of mysterious production function uh, uh, formalism that just happens to have the right kinds of partial derivatives. It comes from the fact that experts produce machines that substitute for labor. And those experts uh, are therefore in demand because they produce uh, a significant market value. And uh, they uh, displace a lot of labor. And then the third point that I think is uh, important and where there's a lot of expertise in the room and a lot of speculation about the future is that the evolution of smart machines has followed a discernible path up until now. And now there's a big debate about what kind of path it will follow in the future. The general point that I think is correct is that machines have tended to be able to displace labor that have two qualities. One is uh, relatively uh, low skill activities at the beginning, so brute force activities and manual labor. Uh, and second is repetitive and predictable activities. Uh, and so the usual uh, classification is along the lines of expertise or skill or cognition of some sort. But I'm sure that that's a very difficult axis to define uh, in that way. And the other is repetitiveness. There, too, I think it's uh, a little bit difficult to define because it's not as if workflows come automatically in one form or another. We make workflows repetitive. And so we redesign our lives to 
work with uh, machines. And so it works uh, in uh, not a simple linear way. I read a book review of a new book. Uh, I don't know if the author's in the room, but it didn't make sense to me what was quoted, uh, which is uh, it said, uh, when, will, um, when will a smart machine be able to read the instructions on an IKEA box and assemble uh, the, uh, the furniture. And the answer that the author gives in this thing is, well, not in this century. And that's absurd because IKEA is going to redo its instructions so that the machine can do it. It's going to be machine readable design uh, quite quickly, probably within 10 years or less, that you could redesign the instructions so that it is completely uh, adaptable. But up until now, I would say machines have been able to replace relatively uh, lower skilled kinds of activities. And now, as Danny said, I'm sure they're going to replace uh, economists uh, soon in many, many areas and probably research in many areas because I don't know about you, but I can't keep up with five journals, much less 50,000 journals, but machines won't have any problem doing that. So I think that we will find ourselves uh, in a happy world where our work is being done for us by others, which sounds pretty good to me, actually. Um, there's just a uh, slight macro problem, which is I want to own the machine that does it. Um, and so there's a little bit of income distributional question uh, that we need to uh, get clear. So we haven't seen this dramatically until recently, and, and the discussion in the profession has really only come intensively, I would say, in the last 15 years. Because up until the 1990s or so, uh, Caldor's stylized facts and a labor augmenting technological change solo model was still our working model in our heads. And it seemed to be just fine that productivity went up, wages went up, prosperity went up, and all good things went together. And if you're in a Cobb Douglas world, all good things have to go together, basically, no matter where the productivity comes from. And that worked pretty well up until uh, the beginning of this century. You might see a slight downtrend. And then many, many kinds of data show uh, that productivity continued to rise and wages stagnated. And then we looked back and said, well, it's actually even a little more interesting than that because certain classes of wages stagnated not just since 2000, but back to the 1970s, actually. And we all came to understand that high school graduates haven't had a real wage increase or real compensation increase for 40 years now. And so the story started to get richer and richer. And I would argue that what we have seen recently is a manifestation of automation, broadly speaking. And it's a manifestation of something that's been going on for a lot longer than the last 17 years. But it's been obscured by uh, aggregation essentially. So we have to disaggregate the economy. And it turns out, uh, both heuristically and statistically, that there's a pretty good disaggregation. And a number of the papers use something like this. Uh, the goods producing sectors, agriculture, mining, construction, manufacturing, uh, is a good aggregate. Construction's a little bit of an outlier because it's been harder to automate uh, till now. But agriculture, mining, and manufacturing are the machine age uh, par excellence because a lot of what the machines do is uh, both brute labor. They literally substitute for hand picking in agriculture or moving uh, products uh, through uh, an assembly process in, um, in manufacturing. And they're pretty repetitive. Or, as I said, you can redesign the workflow so that they are repetitive. I don't think anyone would have thought assembling an automobile as a repetitive activity before the assembly line made it a repetitive activity. So you redesign the workflow 
so that it becomes uh, uh, automatable in, the, in that sense. Then there are a series of uh, basic business services that really, in a way, are ancillary to the goods producing sector. They're not really final demand sectors on their own. Wholesale trade, transport, warehousing, uh, retail trade uh, are how to get those goods to the market. And um, they have often a little bit higher level of expertise than in the production sphere. Uh, they have uh, less predictability uh, of activity, mainly because of the human interface. And that's the big barrier that's uh, being overcome now. Uh, machines did not talk to people uh, effectively until 20 years ago or 25 years ago. And our first 10 years of talking to machines was a pain in the neck. And now we're used to it. Uh, still is a bit of pain in the neck, but as Danny would say, less than talking to other people. Uh, the machines are a little bit more predictable. Uh, and um, so that sector is uh, very much linked to the goods sector. Personal services are typically low skilled and workflow is a little bit harder to, uh, to handle. Now, professional services is the sphere of high level expertise that writes the code, that uh, develops and designs uh, machinery, it's advanced engineering, uh, it's uh, advanced medical skills uh, up until now, though all of these are subject themselves to eventual displacement. But typically, this has been very high expertise and very low workflow predictability. And government, I won't get into uh, the philosophical argument about whether this is a high-skilled, low-skilled, predictable, or unpredictable activity. But uh, I think it's actually almost completely automatable, definitely with less noise. Um, and, uh, but I'm not going to deal too much with uh, e-governance right now. Now, if you disaggregate by these sectors, then you see some pretty striking differences. And the main point is that the labor share of income, which I believe can be thought of, uh, and in a moment I'll argue it more formally, but can be thought of as an automation-induced phenomenon, has been underway uh, pretty seriously for uh, the last uh, 30 years at least, um, and probably longer. I didn't have good, consistent uh, national accounts data to, to draw on for that. But that's, this is the goods producing sector, and several papers note uh, the automotive sector, which has been, uh, uh, repla where assembly line workers have been replaced by robots, but it's pretty pervasive. Uh, especially through the durable goods part of the manufacturing sector and certainly in agriculture where it's basically been almost completely mechanized and we have no more coal miners uh, almost because all of that is subject to uh, almost complete uh, automation. The red line is the basic business sector, trade, wholesale, uh, trade, transport, and so on. And there's also a more gradual, uh, less noted downtrend of uh, the uh, labor share of value added at factor prices. The other sectors don't show that trend at all. And if anything, the professional sphere, which has been the fastest growing part of our economy over the last 50 years, uh, is a very high labor share of value and even slightly rising. So when you aggregate this, you don't see this effect jumping out as sharply as uh, I think it deserves to be noted. And my argument would be it's been this sector where smart machines have done their job up until now, and they're coming for these sectors now. So we can learn a lot about the implications of what's happened here for what's going to happen in the future. Well, one of the things, uh, obviously, uh, and that's quite obvious and important is that uh, if a certain class of labor is displaced and it's basically been lower skilled labor, high school or less say, 
Uh, now even some college is basically getting the same returns as high school. Until you get a bachelor's degree, there's really not a, even a break uh, almost anymore in the data. There is, of course, a tremendous supply response. And one of the most important macro questions is how elastic is that supply response? And that's really a question of how educatable is, is a population. Are there underlying skills and cognitive limits and aptitudes that will earn long-term rents? Or is this all perfectly substitutable on the margin so that the extra year of schooling earns the same rate of return as uh, basically any other asset in the end? We don't know the answer to that. But what we do know, and what I would argue, is that the dramatic structural change doesn't just show up in, it doesn't show up in unemployment, first of all. That's the wrong place to look. Of course, unemployment has to do with the supply side. People want jobs, so they'll find jobs, even if they're very low wages. At very low end, it shows up as a withdrawal from the labor market and going on to the dole in some way. But the idea that the that what we're looking at with automation is the loss of jobs is a misunderstanding. We're looking at whether the labor demand curve is shifting in or out. In other words, what's happening to real incomes is the much more interesting question. But even that depends on the supply response of workers at different skill levels. So the other huge shift in our economy, of course, is the massive increase of educational, educational investment. Uh, and which we undercount in, you know, in multiple ways because we don't count the opportunity costs. We don't even count it as investment, but this has been a huge transformation. Uh, and actually, yeah, so share of employment by education shows, uh, I, I said that the low education, that's by standards in this room, is uh, below a bachelor's degree. And that's declined from about 85% of the economy to about 65%, which is a big change over a 40-year period. And the share of earnings by education is obviously an even bigger change because the wage gap between low-skill and high-skilled workers widened as a result of these processes. Um, what we see is that. Uh, an initial steep widening narrows over time because of the lagged supply response of education. And in the end, whether it goes all the way to zero is basically the question, can everybody ultimately end up with a PhD if that's what the market uh, wage differential is, uh, is, is indicating? So the basic idea that I think is helpful here is a, an increasingly uh, uh, well-treated uh, idea that production is a series of tasks. The series of tasks are uh, filled by occupations. The occupations typically require different aptitudes, skills, and training. And these different tasks have different degrees of uh, of susceptibility to automation. So in the simplest case, I, in the paper, uh, which is uh, still being written, uh, there's a goods producing sector and it has production and non-production tasks, so P and N. And it has uh, buildings. So I say that buildings are complementary to labor, but machines are substitutable for labor. We don't, this is crude, but it, is emphasizing the point that capital is not simply complementary to labor, as in a Cobb-Douglas production function, certain kinds of capital are pure substitutes. So I say that uh, the production side can be carried by labor or by machines. Similarly, the non-production activities, supervisory activities, can be carried by labor or by machines. But to be in the non-production non part requires a higher level of skills. And the quality of the machines, which is given by a parameter here, that's the evolution of this technology. And typically, non-supervisory work up until recently has not been as susceptible to automation as production uh, 
as, as production uh, work. So in the simplest model, I say it's only production workers who are less educated workers who are vulnerable to, uh, vulnerable to, uh, uh, to automation. And then my aim, what I'm working on, is a uh, parameterized computable general equilibrium model for the US economy, basically a one-digit SIC uh, model that allows for this kind of substitution of different kinds of tasks over time and recognizes that those don't fall from heaven uh, as a technological manna, but they require the inputs of the R&D sector. So there is a boom of the R&D sector in the US economy empirically and consequentially for the distribution of income because people with PhDs are the best paid people in the country and uh, they're producing the automation that is putting their counterparts out of, out of high wage work. Uh, and that's the dynamic uh, politically uh, and, and uh, from an income distribution uh, part of the economy. If you simulate this kind of uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, this is not to be taken seriously because the parameterization is not serious yet, but this is uh, an example where uh, there is a, uh, the single parameter that is being studied here is basically the introduction of, I would call it a GPT in the sense that the productivity of returns to R&D go up. And so there's a parameter that determines how productive R&D is. That's the only parameter. But it's designed so that as intellectual property rises, the first jobs that go are the more easily automated jobs. And over time, you capture more and more of the labor force. So the first effects of this are a boom of higher education a boom of wages of engineers, and a loss of wages of those on the assembly line who continue to work, but at lower pay. That works out over time with a supply side response on education so that more of the economy becomes uh, educated. The wages of unskilled, or the labor demand for unskilled workers continues to decline. The next step kicks in where a higher skilled uh, cotter of workers faces automation. Uh, that starts the decline of uh, their real wages. The labor share of income continues to fall and so forth. What is the end point of a story like that? And I'll just conclude here. Uh, the end point of the story is that all of this is potentially welfare improving in the simple sense that the output capacity of the economy is expanding, but it's, of course, tremendously uh, disruptive in terms of growing income inequality. And to get the, uh, a Pareto improving design requires a significant and, and a growing amount of uh, redistribution. So the bottom line of my story is that this process is underway. It's been underway in a significant uh, sense for several decades. And we're probably in a period where it's coming after our jobs too. Um, and uh, if we manage uh, the distributional consequences of that, that will all be great because uh, while all of our computers uh, have the next conference, we'll all be having a nice cup of coffee uh, in the uh, coffee shop next door. Thank you. Hey, thanks for uh, having me here to speak. Um, I'm here to talk about um, uh, education and AI. Um, I'll, I'll respond a bit to um, Jeff's paper, but it arrives sufficiently late that it basically placed no constraints on my content um, whatsoever. So I appreciate that. Um, I, uh, but I um, read um, the broader set of papers, and I think um, what I'll talk about uh, fits into um, the conference um, writ large. So you know, the, the question um, 
I study the economics of education, and I think an important question for what you're talking about in this room is, um, can we increase the number of highly skilled people using the education system? So a lot of what you're talking about all depends on us being able to uh, uh, create workers who, um, who know how to learn and who are not immediately made redundant by each improvement in technology. Otherwise, we're going to end up with this labor immiseration um, uh, situation, highly unequal um, economy. Um, you know, our, our classical model would be as the returns to skill and education go up, um, education rises as well, with the most academically able um, obtaining that advanced education. And in that world, we got nothing to worry about. So I'm going to tell you instead what world we're in. Um, uh, so uh, these are statistics um, uh, from the census organized by year of birth uh, uh, of the share of the population that has obtained any college, and that's the red line, and has obtained a BA. Uh, and in my world, the MBER Economics of Education, we include this among the skilled folks. So now I'm even more depressed, right, because this is now being classified in, in your categorization as, as most of them being unskilled, right? So you can see that number has risen considerably. Um, uh, we're up to um, probably more like 70% at this point. And this is of the entire cohort. So this is, you know, the net product of whether people finish high school um, and then go on to college. Um, so this is driven not just by um, increases in college entry um, conditional on, on high school graduation, but increases in high school graduation. About 90% of the population graduates high school at this point. As you can see, the BA completion rate, and this is BA by your early 20s or so, uh, has increased a lot less. Um, and I'm showing this by birth cohort rather than for the entire economy because this is essentially where any increases in education come from. Very few people return to school in their 30s or 40s. If we're going to see increases in education, it's going to come from birth cohorts coming through um, and increasing the education levels. So that might be more up to 29, 30, 32 at this point, but not much higher. Okay? And then within that, what you've been talking about as highly skilled, of course, is the graduate degrees. And that's an even smaller uh, cut of this, of this group. Um, this, is, this just cuts the same thing by um, uh, gender. Uh, so this is any college, and here we can see that it's women who have accounted um, for most of the recent increase uh, in college attendance. And this is even starker when we look at the BA. So um, male BA attend uh, attainment has been essentially flat for about three decades. So most of the action uh, is coming um, from women. And obviously, if uh, you're um, not completing a BA, you're not going on to get that postgraduate work either. Um, so this is, these are the numbers we're currently um, uh, working with. Um, uh, BA is um, uh, moving quite slowly, and that's what we've been talking about, and Jeff talks about is basically the, the middle skilled. Um, the growth is also uh, highly uneven. If you have in your mind that what's going on is basically the, the smartest kids are rising to the top, um, here's some statistics by income. So this is by uh, your um, uh, family income as a child. We're breaking the population up into four quartiles. Um, this uh, uh, first, second, third, top quartile. This is uh, the, those born in the early 60s. Uh, and then this is people born in the early 80s. Uh, and this is college attendance now. And you can see that college attendance has, has gone up um, across the board. Um, uh, uh, 80%, again, this is just, this is unconditional on anything. This is just um, the entire population. Here's BA. So we've gone from 5% of the lowest income uh, group getting a BA to 9%. And this is uh, uh, during the era be between these two periods is when financial aid expanded enormously, uh, higher education expanded enormously. So um, we got a lot, you know, basically it's, 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 it's highly skewed by income. And this is not simply explained by uh, the highest income kids, say, having the best academic skills. Um, this is uh, uh, organizing um, uh, uh, BA completion um, by low SES, high SES. And what you can see is in the low SES kids with the highest scores, just 41% of them are getting a BA, which is basically uh, the same as for the um, mediocre rich kids. Okay, so we've got a system that is, that is essentially replicating income when it comes to 
uh, who's getting a BA. Now, can we fix this by um, uh, one proposal I've seen in several of the papers, you know, make, make college free and then therefore everything will, will get fixed and we will have more people going to college. And indeed, you know, tuition prices have tripled um, uh, over time, but net of aid um, uh, and for those low income students, uh, tuition prices really haven't changed much at all. So I'll jump through these quickly, but believe me when I say that basically the cost of attending college for the lowest income students has not been going up very much um, uh, in recent years. Um, so I'm just going to leave you um, uh, with this, with this um, figure up as I, as I make my final points. Um, uh, um, the extensive margin as we've expanded college education in the U.S. has been in very low quality schools. So we have not added to our Harvards. We have not added to our University of Michigan's. We haven't really added to our Universities of Massachusetts. You know, our, our expansion has been in the community colleges uh, and in for-profit colleges. Both of these have extremely low graduation rates. And this is not just a US phenomenon. This has happened in other countries as well, where the um, college sector has expanded. It has done through so not by adding more public capacity in terms of universities, but by letting the for-profit sector do it. And it's been an unmitigated failure in every country that's tried it. So uh, uh, it's not going to be the answer. Um, the private sector is essentially not going to fix it. We need to build um, institutions, public institutions. So changing the price, students, smart students by themselves, cannot get themselves a college education no matter how cheap it is. Manipulating the price is not going to do it. We need to build colleges that are good colleges that can train those students um, uh, and then let them attend this. So this is a supply constraint. Uh, as opposed to a demand side constraint in terms of us getting more people into college. And it's not just at the college level. So what we're seeing from the evidence is that we can increase graduation rates, increase skills by improving the college's instruction, um, the institutions themselves. We can also do so by improving K-12 education. Why, that's even easier, of course, right? Uh, so um, uh, what we have ahead of us, if we want to expand the population of skilled workers, um, is not manipulating prices, uh, but improving government institutions through tax spending building. Thank you. Uh, Eric? So it's great to see these papers on this really important topic. Um, I want to ask uh, both, both uh, Jeff and Susan the, the, uh, about how things are different now than before. Both of you sort of looked at these historical series. But a lot of this conference is about how AI is different. Um, I think David Otter is here, and he's talked about um, Polanyi's paradox, limiting what, what um, machines can do. Oh, there he is. Um, and I've been saying more about the end of Polanyi's paradox in the past few papers, which is this idea. Well, just to remind you, Polanyi's paradox is the idea that we all know more than we can tell, um, that it's hard for us to uh, express and write down and codify um, things that we know about how to recognize a face or ride a bicycle. Um, and that has, for most of history, put enormous constraints on what we can teach machines to do, because if you want to code, you have to codify, you have to be able to express what it is you want the machine to do. Of course, as we heard yesterday, um, we're seeing a, a new paradigm, machine learning, uh, the end of, uh, of good old-fashioned AI, where you, you had symbolic or good old-fashioned programming, where you uh, codified exactly what you wanted to do, and instead, the machines are figuring out on their own not just how to play the game of Go, but how to um, have a data center that is, uh, has 40% less cooling than any of the humans could figure out or, or many other types of applications. So I, I want to hear from, the, uh, from Jeff in particular about, about how, the, how you see that changing um, your, your model in terms of uh, the role of educated people and education and, and putting the information in and, and, and uh, see if, if those same trends should just be extrapolated or if we're in a new, a new era. Okay, so we're going to collect questions and then get response. So next is Rebecca. Jeff, my understanding is that there's some discussion about the declining labor share. You're showing that it varies by uh, occupational classes, of course, interesting. But there's at least some argument that some of the decline in labor share is driven by political changes, uh, changes in the tax regime, changes in our transfer policies, and so on. And I would like to invite you to speculate about the interaction between the dynamics that you identified and the political dynamics in which we currently find ourselves. 
and, uh, and whether that increases or decreases the odds that we'll be owning the machines that are running the conference as we're having our cup of coffee. Yeah, I think I just wanted to maybe double down on Eric's point, but be really specific about it and related to something Joel said yesterday that I thought was very important. So on the one hand, there's no doubt that in some sense, we in this room probably underestimate the degree to which the information technology revolution is now just hitting its stride, right? And so Eric's talked about that very articulately in many ways over many years, but that in some sense, we all experienced the IT revolution basically like 25 years ago, but it's only today that it's really washing over basically the great mass of, of jobs and activities in the economy. I think that it's really useful to distinguish that I think with Jeff's facts, as well as even the theory, and I think how you've been thinking about when you use the word robots, is really about automation. And that automation is a very direct consequence of the basic ability of digitization and the basic ability to do um, kind of, you know, you, know, you know, to basically set that up. I think that it's useful then to distinguish that from the very specific new thing that is multi-layered neural networks and their particular performance properties and the ability to predict against very disparate data sets. That, I think, at least I took away from yesterday as being at a much earlier stage. And so if you were in 1880, the real action in the economy was the coreless steam, in, steam engine, not the electric motor yet. Even though Edison was kind of doing all this, we, we, we misattribute the 1880s as the age of electrification when it was in fact the age of the actually distributed steam engine. And I just think that that is a useful starting point, but you know, very, very interesting. So I, I thought the discussion about, uh, Sue's discussion about education was um, interesting and great, and it, it re relates to Jeff's points. Um, you know, I, I think something we have always been terrible at is the quest questions around, you know, what specific educational skills should people be investing in? And maybe that's been kind of okay in that the BA for a long time has been the ticket to a pretty reliable ticket to the middle class lifestyle. And I don't know if we've been thinking enough about the question of whether changes in technology will lead to really big changes in the riskiness of educational investments in that, you know, some people are going to invest in skills that are just gonna be the skills that are displaced and other people are gonna invest in the skills that turn out to be the skills that are slow to be displaced and whether we have any, and any previous attempt we have ever made to be good at this has been disastrous, but I'm curious whether we have anything we can say um, on that topic. Uh, two remarks about, uh, about education. Uh, the first is that I think it's important to distinguish between the kind of educational forces that actually create the technological knowledge and those that teach the population how to cope with it and how to live with it. And on the former, I would say, you know, most of these data don't matter because technological change is generated by a very small segment of the labor force. You know, there's a whole literature now on this sort of upper tail human capital. And basically, you know, within, you know, five or 10% of the labor force, at most probably less, most of this te technological change that we are uh, talking about it being created. The reason we should educate the rest is not because they're going to add all that much to artificial intelligence or machine learning or algorithm or anything like that, but they have to learn to cope with it. And there too, and here I'm, you know, undercutting the fact that I have uh, been teaching at a university for over 40 years. I actually think universities probably don't matter very much. I have been totally persuaded by a range of work all the way from David Barker to Jim Heckman and Janet Curry, that actually what, by age six, it's essentially over, you know? <laughs> that we, you know, that what, what you are going to become in life, what your capabilities are going to be, are almost entirely set by, you know, in utero, early childhood, and, you know, and, and very early education. And, um, you know, I just attended a talk that Jim gave, and, it might, you know, the data really blow your mind. I mean, it, it really, is quite amazing 
how powerful that effect is. So if we want to reallocate our resources, okay, we should probably not necessarily make sure that these curbs keep going up. We should pump everything we have and give people access to the best health and educational conditions in the first six years of life. Great. Um, I want to give both Susan and Jeff the chance to respond. So uh, maybe we'll start with Susan, and then Jeff will have the last word. A good one to respond to at the very end there. Right. Um, uh, so um, the uh, you know question: Can we can we educate people? <laughs> Was essentially your question, right? So, <laughs> and um, indeed, Heckman has a very um, firm um, opinion on this. And early childhood does uh, matter a lot. Uh, you know, the numbers that show how large the um, gaps are by socioeconomic status uh, and how persistent they are through school is conditional on our current system, of course, which doesn't do a very good job of, of teaching low-income um, students. Uh, we have evidence from, um, strong evidence from a lot of that we can actually um, change that. So there are effective ways to improve education uh, all the way through the pipeline. Um, but they have so um, your system should be about what our system um, uh, is doing right now and not about what any biological constraints are on the ability um, of um, people to learn or the distribution of skill. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I think it's absolutely right to use a general category like automation uh, as a replacement of, uh, of uh, labor by machines as a very broad category, and that has been going on uh, at least since uh, the spinning jenny, for example, uh, which uh, put a lot of spinners uh, out of uh, out of work, uh, or uh, agricultural machinery. So it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the digital uh, age. Of course, with uh, with more sophisticated uh, computer-controlled machinery and and uh, all of the cybernetics uh, revolution, so-called, and the redesign of workflow, uh, this linked more and more to the digital revolution. And that became uh, quite intense in many manufacturing processes already uh, by the 1960s, uh, and certainly by the 70s and 80s. That's not artificial intelligence as we use it today, so I think it's really important to make those distinctions. Artificial intelligence, of course, is also a very broad concept, and the breakthroughs, I, as I understand it, really are the machine learning breakthroughs of, of the last uh, 10 or 15 years, which are simply unbelievable and in a, in a sense unexpected, uh, that uh, you can actually do language translation almost purely statistically without needing a linguist on your team. Uh, and that's a phenomenally uh, great discovery. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of uh, a lot that's going to come from that uh, discovery that's extraordinarily rich. What does it mean? It, certainly the most basic thing uh, in my modeling context, it means a larger and larger swath of occupations uh, will be replaced by machines. Uh, and that will have all of these ramifications for income distribution uh, that I think are quite significant. And I'm very much of the view that we're in a, a big sweep of, uh, of technology uh, as, as a result of this. Um, what will it mean for the future of jobs and education is, of course, uh, what we're really talking about in this macro side of this issue. Uh, and when it comes to education, I would say a, a couple of things. One is that, as we just heard between Susan and Joel, I think the, uh, the way to reconcile uh, these different positions is early childhood development and growing up in a, uh, in a family environment where you are tended to uh, decent nutrition, low stress, uh, good health care, uh, and a loving household uh, gives a lifetime of gra greater capacity, and those early years matter. But taking a high SES kid and saying, 
we're going to really treat you well for six years and then you're on your own uh, is not really conducive to good long-term labor market performance either. So I think it's more helpful when the parents help put the kid through uh, their PhD program. Um, so I don't see this really as a conflict between early childhood development and, uh, and education. It does raise a big question, what kind of skills are needed? And there are two very different answers to that question, it seems to me. Uh, and Jan uh, already hinted at one of them, which I very much believe. One is you could say, well, the boom really is STEM education. I mean, everyone should be coders. Probably not, uh, for two reasons. One is uh, there will be uh, the supply response and then the incomes will go down. Uh, and probably coding is very much susceptible to uh, actually these same forces. So the other kind of education is being human because maybe what our, we're really gonna be good at as complementary to the machines is that the machines will be machines and we'll be humans. And so actually, learning things that are good for humans. Maybe the humanities will become the most uh, profitable labor market activity because all the STEM stuff will be done in your little box. Uh, and what will really count is uh, can you make a nice poem? Can you paint a nice picture? And can you be nicer to someone than the robot that's caring for them so that they want to be with you for a couple of hours even though you're just a human being? My guess is humans will not be replaced on the human dimension by machines for a while, but maybe that's too optimistic too. If, if I'm waiting for the second season of Westworld, I don't know if it's out yet, <laughs> but um, so far uh, I'm persuaded that we still have a role at least as humans, uh, and uh, that's probably what we should focus on. So we need some humanities in the training so that we remember what being human uh, is about. 